Bond energy. Bond energy, abbreviated B, is the amount of energy in kilojoules per mole required to break a chemical bond. Bond energies are important because they're used to estimate the energy change, delta E, for a chemical reaction. Breaking a chemical bond is an endothermic process because energy must be put into the bond to break it. For example, consider breaking a rubber band. You can stretch it until the applied tension exceeds the capacity of the rubber to hold together. Stretching the rubber band to the point of breaking is a way of putting in energy into the system. So we could have two atoms connected by a rubber band bond. We put enough energy into that bond to stretch it to the point where it breaks, where we have two individual atoms. That input of heat is a positive change of energy. The term endothermic means adding energy to a system. So if we apply it to a chemical reaction, let's say that we have an H2 molecule and we break it into two H atoms. To break that bond, we have to put heat into the system so heat uh, occurs on the reactant side of the chemical equation. It's an endothermic process. Heat is being input into the system. That's a positive change in heat. So bond breaking is an endothermic process. Again, because we have to put heat into the system to break the bonds. An exothermic process is the process of removing energy from a system, like a chemical molecule and bond formation is an exothermic process, a negative change in heat. So if we form an H2 molecule from two separate H atoms, because that final H2 molecule is more stable than the two individual atoms together, this H2 molecule has less energy than the atoms here, and so that extra amount of heat is passed from the system to the surroundings as heat. So for an exothermic process, heat always is written on the product side of the chemical equation. It's going to be a negative change in heat. Going back to our H2 molecule, consider breaking an H2 bond. The breaking of that H2 bond can re be represented by this equation, H2 in the gas phase. Those two, two individual H atoms, we could have written it this way. Okay. And if we use the table of bond energies, we would find that the amount of energy required to break one mole of H2 molecules into ad atoms is 435 kilojoules per mole. That change in energy would be the bond energy of that H, H bond. Since delta E is positive, this means that it took 435 kilojoules to break the bond for one mole of H atoms. We could represent the process this way, and we could find that 435 kilojoules per mole from the table of bond energies. Here's a link for a table, or you could go to your textbook. Here's a problem like you'll have to do on your first examination. Use a table of bond energies to estimate the energy change delta E for this reaction. C3H8 in the gas phase plus 5O2 in the gas phase goes to the products 3Cl2 and 4 water molecules also in the gas phase. So to compute the change in energy for this reaction, we're going to use bond energies. So we have to understand the structures of each reactant and product. Here's the loose structure for C3H8, propane. There's two carbons bonded together by single covalent bonds, and then there's eight CH single covalent bonds. We know that the L2 molecule contains two oxygen atoms connected by a double bond. That happens five times. The product side, this would be the loose structure for a CL2 molecule, so I haven't shown all the dots. But the idea here is that each CL2 molecule contains two C double bond O's. And of course, the water molecule with its characteristic V-shaped structure contains two OH bonds. So we'll go to a table of bond energies and we'll look up the bond energies for CC bonds, for CH bonds, for an O2 double bond, a C double bond O, and for OH bonds.
the table tells us that each carbon carbon bond has a bond energy of 345 kilojoules per mole. Each CH bond has a bond energy of 415, and each O2 molecule has a bond energy of 495. Since there's two CC bonds, we multiply the 345 by 2, the 415 by 8, and each O2 bond energy by 5 because there's 5 all 2 molecules on the reactants. So we get 690, 3320, and 2475. We add them up. That's a 6845 kilojoules. So that's going to be a positive energy change because remember we said that to break bonds we need to input energy. We need to add heat to the reactant molecules to break those bonds. That's an endothermic change. That Q here is 6845. On the product side, bond formation is an exothermic process. When we compute the total bond energies for all these molecules here, we're going to tack on a negative sign because forming the bonds, forming a more stable molecule from individual atoms is an exothermic process. So on the product side, we have three Cl2s. Each Cl2 has two C double bond O's. Each C double bond O has a bond energy of 800. That happened six times, 4,800 kilojoules for Cl2. We have four water molecules, each with two OH bonds. Each OH bond has a bond energy of 40, 40, 460. Multiply it by eight, we get 3680. We add all those bond energies up on the product side, we get 8480. And since bond formation is an exothermic process, we're going to tack on a negative sign. To get the total delta E for this reaction here, we simply add the ex endothermic changes to the exothermic changes. We add the uh, energy required to break the bonds, which is a positive 6485, to the energy required to form the bonds, which is a negative 8480. We get a net 1995 kilojoules. So this reaction overall is exothermic. Energy is negative. That means heat overall is going to be on the product side. Our next section is on enthalpy. And enthalpy is given the symbol H. Enthalpy is a state function which is used to represent the heat flow at constant pressure. So we can say change in enthalpy delta H is Q sub P heat flow at constant pressure. Another way of defining enthalpy is by saying that it is the sum of internal energy and pressure volume work here. That's given by this equation equal H equals E plus P times V. This equation comes from is beyond the scope of the course here. Now let's consider changes in enthalpy since in all of our systems here, we, we have reactants going to products. We have an initial state and a final state. We're interested in the changes that happen between the initial and final state. So we want to change the enthalpy. We want delta H. That's going to be delta quantity E plus PV. We're going to assume that pressure is constant. So we can take the P outside of the parentheses and put it in front of the delta V. Delta H is delta H plus P delta V. No, you don't need to memorize these equations. If you need to use them, I would give them to you on a test. We also know that work is a minus P delta V, or switching signs, P delta V is the minus W. So we can take P delta V, which is in this equation, and substitute the minus W. We get delta H equals delta E plus P delta V, or delta E minus W. From the first law, though, we know that delta E is Q plus W. And since we're dealing with constant pressure, the Q becomes QP. So delta E is QP plus W. And so then what we can do next then is we can take this and substitute it in for this here. We get delta H equals delta E minus W. Okay. Or QP plus W minus W or QP. So we just derived that delta H is Q. Enthalpy change is equal to heat flow at constant pressure. Why is this important? Well, 
chemists run their reactions at constant pressure. We might run a chemical reaction in the beaker in a laboratory. The atmospheric pressure is going to be constant for that reaction. So one way to figure out the heat of reaction, whether it's an exothermic or endothermic reaction, is to measure that heat evolved or absorbed by the reaction system during that chemical reaction at constant pressure. And it turns out that we can calculate that delta H by measuring the QP, or as you'll see shortly, we have these delta H tabulated for different types of compounds, and we don't really need to go into the lab and measure the QPs. When delta H is greater than zero, that means we have a positive change in enthalpy. The system or chemical reaction gains heat from the surrounding, delta H is positive. When delta H is negative, that would be an exothermic chemical reaction. The system loses heat to the surroundings. A goes to B plus heat. Being evolved in the first case, heat plus reactant A goes to product B. We just said that when delta H is larger than zero, we have an endothermic process. The system gains heat from the surroundings, so we can represent it this way heat going into the system. The system could be some chemical reaction. On the other hand, when we have an exothermic process, delta H is negative, less than zero. The system loses heat to the surroundings, and the system could be a chemical reaction. Enthalpy change for a chemical reaction, again, delta H. So delta H is enthalpy change. We're going to call it sim simply heat of reaction, heat of the chemical reaction. It's the heat released or absorbed in a chemical reaction or a physical change at constant pressure. And it's equal to the enthalpy of the final state minus the enthalpy of the initial state for a chemical reaction, the final state of the product, and the initial states are the reactants. So enthalpy products minus enthalpy of reactants. Delta H is tabulated for different molecules, we could simply subtract and add and subtract and get a result for delta H. An exothermic reaction is one in which heat is released from the system to the surroundings. Delta H is negative. Heat is a product. For an endothermic reaction, it's a reaction in which heat is absorbed. So heat is a and delta H is positive for an endothermic graphs. So, so if we graph enthalpy versus reaction progress going from reactants to products for an exothermic reaction, since the products have less energy than the reactants, the delta H is going to be a negative number. So this diagram corresponds to this type of chemical reaction. Reactants go to product, products plus heat being released to the surrounding. Heat goes from the system to the surroundings. And the products have less energy than the reactants. And so delta H for the reaction is equal to delta H of products minus delta H of reactants. Since this product energy is less than the reactants, the change is going to be negative. Endothermic reaction is just the opposite. We said that in an endothermic reaction, heat is input into the reactants. We write heat on the reactant side. Heat is added to the reactants to go to products. Because we've added heat to the reactants, the products must have a higher energy than the reactants. So a uh, energy diagram of enthalpy versus reaction progress would look like this. This time we have heat input from the surroundings into the system. The system then has more energy in the final state. So the products have more energy than the reactants. Delta H is going to be a positive number. Exercise. Given this reaction, CH4 plus 2O2 goes to Cl2 plus 2H2O, and that delta H is minus 890 kilojoules. What kind of reaction is this? This would be an exothermic reaction because the delta H is a negative number. That means that the heat would be written on the product side. They with energy as part of the equation. So, so heat must be a product. You can say 
heat. I just put 890 kilojoules this time for that. See how much heat is released when 4.50 grams of methane burn if minus 890 joules are released when mo one mole of methane burns. That should be kilojoules there. Change that there. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start out by writing this down. We have minus 890 kilojoules released per mole when methane burns, but we don't have one mole. We have 4.5 grams of methane. So we have to convert the 4.5 grams of methane to moles. Methane has the formula CH4. So its molar mass is 12 for the carbon plus 4 times 1 for each of the hydrogens, around 16 grams per mole. We take our given 4.5 grams, we divide by 16, we we'll multiply by 1 mole per 16 grams, convert that to number of moles, multiply the number of moles by minus 890 kilojoules per mole, get minus 215 kilojoules. Another problem, compute the enthalpy change in kilojoules at 0.25 grams of magnesium in the solid state burn according to this chemical reaction. 2mg plus O2 goes to 2mgO and delta H is minus 1204 kilojoules. So right away we know this is an exothermic reaction that heat is going to be on the product side of this equation. To do this problem here, we're given 0.25 grams of magnesium in the problem. We convert that to moles by dividing by the molar mass of magnesium. So this gives us the moles of magnesium. And from our chemical equ equation here, we evolve 1204 kilojoules of heat per 2 moles of magnesium. So we we'll multiply the number of moles of magnesium that we're given by the 1204 kilojoules per 2 moles of magnesium to get a minus 6.19 kilojoules of heat released. Standard state is the physical state of the most stable form of a pure substance at a pressure of one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. So 25 plus 273 converts 25 Celsius to 298 Kelvin. So this is going to be important because when we tabulate values of enthalpies for the formation of various compounds to make the results comparable to each other, we're going to tabulate those delta H's for the same pressure, one atmosphere pressure, and for 25 Celsius or 298. Oxygen can exist as atoms, as a molecule, or even as its allotrope, ozone. But the most stable form of oxygen is O2 in our atmosphere. So we say that O2 gas is standard state of oxygen. Standard enthalpy of formation. And here's the symbol here. Delta HF0. Formation. That's the F. Zero here means standard. is tabulate these enthalpy values for atoms, molecules, and compounds. And to make them comparable to each other, we're going to use the same standard state, meaning 25 Celsius, one atmosphere pressure in the most stable form of that compound. So it's the heat absorbed or released during the synthesis of one mole of a compound from its elements, each in their standard states at 290 Kelvin, one atmosphere pressure consult the table on the internet to get the, those values or use the textbook. Delta H, a formation is zero for any element or molecule in its standard state. So H2, O2, and carbon graphite, their delta H is zero. That's, here's the link, standard enthalpies of formation. And here are some values here. Notice then that for any element in its standard state, looks like I have oxygen twice here, that delta H value is zero. Delta H's, the formation, are in kilojoules per mole as well. Which reactions at 25 Celsius represent standard enthalpies of formation? So, first reaction, 2Na plus 1 half O2 goes to 
Na2O, and in the second reaction, NO in the gas phase plus one half O2 goes to NO2. Right, so the first one actually represents a standard delta H value because the reactants in standard states as atoms or molecules forming a compound. But in the second reaction, this does not represent a standard delta H value because one of the reactants is actually a compound and not an element in its standard state. So we're going to compute enthalpy changes for chemical reactions like this simple example here. We have two reactants, capital A's and B's, and two products, capital C's and D's. In the lower case letters are the coefficients, the number of moles of the reactant. So we have A moles of A plus B moles of B equals C moles of C plus D moles of B. And the delta H, the enthalpy change for this reaction, is given by subtracting the reactant enthalpies from the product enthalpy. So note that when I do the subtraction that I take the products and we multiply the delta H values for each product by its coefficient, add them together for the products, and then do the same thing for the reactants, but we subtract the reactants from the products. It's final state minus initial state. Okay. Final state is products, initial state is reactants. These are actually standard, so we could put a zero on each of these. Standard enthalpies of formation for each. And these delta H's, remember the delta H's are given in kilojoules per mole. And when we multiply by the number of moles, which would be the coefficient there, the moles cancel. So our answer here is going to be in kilojoules. So if we take that equation and we make it more concise, the delta H for the reaction would be the sum of the enthalpies for the products minus the sum of enthalpies for the reactants. It's products minus reactants. It's final state minus initial state. If you reverse that equation, I won't give you any credit on a test. Simple example, compute the enthalpy of reaction for water in the liquid phase going to water in the gas phase. You go to the table of enthalpies, which you can get from the textbook on the internet. We find that delta H, these are standards, okay? Delta H for water in the liquid phase is minus 285.8 kilojoules per mole. And delta H for water in the gas phase is minus 241.8 kilojoules per mole. And the coefficients of each of these is a 1. Understood to be 1 because there's no number there. So we have 1 mole of this and 1 mole of product there. Okay, so to get the answer then, we take the enthalpies of the product, which is this, and subtract from it the enthalpy of the reactants, which is minus 285.8. So minus 241.8 minus some minus 285.8. We get a positive 34 kilojoules. I'll show you the units here, but the coefficient is 1, so we're multiplying this by 1 mole, and this by 1 mole. Moles cancel out, so the answer is going to be in kilojoules. This is going to be an endothermic reaction because delta H is positive. Heat would be written on the reactant side of this equation. If we drew an enthalpy diagram, it would look like this. This would be H2O in the liquid phase. This would be H2O in the gas phase. So H, progress of reaction. And that delta H there would be positive 44. Compute the enthalpy change for this reaction. Again, we're assuming these are all standard enthalpy changes. CaOH taken twice in the solid phase, calcium hydroxide plus Cl2 in the gas phase, goes to water in the gas phase, and calcium carbonate in the solid phase. So I go to the table of enthalpy values. I would give you these values on a test. And we look up kilojoules per mole, these numbers here, the delta H's for each reactant. Coefficients here are 1, so these are in kilojoules per mole. We're going to multiply by 1 mole, so the moles cancel 
Donate for the reaction then is products minus reactant. So our two products there and there multiply by one and we subtract the sum of the enthalpies of the reactants. So subtract sum of enthalpies of the reactants this and that added together. Get this here, get a minus 69.1 kilojoules. So this is an exothermic reaction because delta H is negative. Heat would be on the product side of the equation if we drew an enthalpy versus progress of reaction diagram. It would look like this. Our reactants are there, our products are there. The difference delta H between the two is a negative 69.9 kilojoules. Next one, a little bit more difficult because some of these reactants and products have coefficients. Again, we want delta H. These are going to be standard delta H's for this reaction here. We go to a table and we look these values up. Of course, for the oxygen molecule, we assume it's in its standard state. So delta H for any molecule, pure molecule in its standard state is going to be a zero. So we look up these values, minus 1273 kilojoules per mole. The delta H for C6H12O6 glucose. CO2, each CO2 is minus 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Each water has a delta H of minus 285.8. So to get the delta H for the reaction, we subtract the reactants from the products. So it's in kilojoules per mole. We multiply by six moles. So that add to it. Look at the products here, CO2 and water. We have to multiply the minus 393.5 for the CO2 by 6 because its coefficient is 6. Add to it 6 times minus 285.8 for water in the liquid phase. And then subtract the sum of the reactants. 1 times minus 1273.3 and 6 times 0, which is 0. We go through the arithmetic, we get a negative 2802.8 kilojoules for this reaction. Okay. It's exothermic heat is on the product side.